and we have the privilege of having Trishia Huang speak today, otherwise known as CJ. Um, and if you haven't caught his exhibition, it's right outside the galleries here. Um, it's the, the, this is the first official day that it's um, being seen. It's called Synthetic Seduction, and it kind of follows this line of inquiry that CJ has been exploring for the past few years um, that started at the Smithsonian Institute and his research with um, evolutionary adaptations and especially bioluminescence in um, deep sea creatures. Um, and I will let CJ explain a little bit further about uh, that and his um, work in general. Hey. Hey. Um, thank you. Uh, um, I'm going to show you some videos and um, maybe kind of going back to some of my earlier works and some of the, the place I grew up and and some of the influences on um, I grew up in Taiwan and um, that my my grandfather used to run in the hardware store and there are a lot of these um, hardware stores in Taiwan with just a lot of farm equipment or different types of like uh, things, but everything's always very crowded. There's a lot of stuff mixed together, and I also very interested in like night markets in Taiwan, where there's just a lot of I like the energy and then the, a lot of the color of different things that happens in the night markets. Um, anything goes in the night market, like they said, they put like mohawks on puppies, and just <laughs> a lot of these random things that you see there, um, and and then. You see a lot of like either toys or these things you see there, but they only they're only there for a very short amount of time. Kind of like in dollar stores, you know, things kind of rotate in and out really fast. Um, and my parents they live really close to an electric town in Taipei, so every time I go back and visit the electric towns, you can find a lot of components like uh, fans, resistors, or LEDs or different things. Um, and then I was also was looking at different electric towns in Japan. This is uh, one in Tokyo, in Akihabara, where things are like, super, um, uh, very specific. You know, this was one store, just resistors and it was just uh, transformers and different things like that. Um, at the same time, there's this whole section on like people are building their own robots out of servo motors. Um, and they have like robot contests, ro like soccer robots and um, and my earlier work, um, these are installations I made from uh, painter's plastic, uh, those plastic you get at hardware stores, um, the one when you're painting your, your sofa, or, I mean, if you're painting your walls and you cover up your sofa, and you know, very thin. And people are given like these lab coats and they have, they have to put on these booties and I give them uh, these different remotes. And they explore these installations and the remote control turns on different fans and inflates um, plastic and it expands and I started this project uh, from the place I was living. This was um, when I was in San Diego. And so when you walk through, um, you find different things. Like sometimes, uh, you know, I was living there so you can sometimes you can see the bed and then the kitchen. And I also take, collect a lot of toys. And if I find them on the street, I modify them. And, um, and so, it, as people go through, you find different things unexpected. Maybe you turn on the remote, something else turns on, and different lights. Um, this is a remote control blimp. I kind of modify it, and I remember my, my bed is like right behind here. And then the bathroom is going here. This is the bathroom. This is a remote control car. I kind of rewired it so it just kind of twitches <laughs> there. <coughs> and I was using a lot of like, I was taking apart a lot of the old things like uh, cassette tape players, um, guitar tuners, and then rewire them to do different things. Like the, uh, the guitar tuners, um, it has a microphone on it, so I wire it. So I put a little keyboard when people play different sounds and they pick up the sound, they'll turn on different things, more lights. Um, this one, it's a, there's a television attached to a, a bench, and then if you come in, it, triggers the motion sensor, turn on this motor, and then just keep moving this television. You can't really watch it. Um, yeah, this is the guitar tuner I was telling you about. Um, and then it, this is a cassette player that took it apart. All these strands are also, also made from the same plastic. Um, so um, so they, they kind of come in different forms, this flat sheets, and then there's, I tied them in knots. That one has a like, third horsepower swirl fan inside. And, when you turn it on, it makes that section of the room really windy. 
and then that this piece then kind of went to New York and um, and at that time I started exploring different experimenting with different liquids. Um, this is a liquid I was using a uh, back of a um, break the highlighter pen and I mix it with either pine salt, Mr. Clean, and distilled water. And um, the pine salt, Mr. Clean, has the antibacteria function, so it um, prevents the bacteria from growing in the water liquid. And so when people walk into the room, it activates the pump and it pumps the liquid through the little tubes and then goes through this hose around the room and then comes down through the plastic bottle and comes down. And in different thickness, of tubing have different reaction. This one has um, is mixing air and inside, so you get this little segment. So when you when a water pump is pumping the the water up, it fills the tube into like a solid color. But when it shuts off, the gravity pulls the water back down, and then you get these little segments. In my earlier work, I you know I leave everything like a lot of the parts how I mix the liquids like these bottles, has all the highlighter pen inside when I'm kind of you know, uh, soaking the liquid so you can see all the stuff inside. So the more you explore, you can find some of the answers where do things come from, how do I use it. And later on this piece kind of went to uh, the Swiss uh, exhibition in Spain where um, the space started to get larger, so it's large enough that um, people were, I, I was able to make these paths and um, using a lot of zip ties, and the path was big enough that people can even push like baby strollers in. And still, all these are the same plastic. Um, this was a piece um, I collaborated with another artist um, named Brody Condom. He does, uh, he's more like a game hacker, you know, he, and I'm more like a hardware guy. And we were talking about, you know, when you're playing games, when the game characters die, what happened to them? You know, and because they usually like, they kind of, they kind of shake and then they vanish. And where do they go? So we decided to put all the dead game characters into this space. And um, so they're just floating in this space. And I took, uh, I built this device where people use a turkey baster and they can suck these liquids out. And inside this funnel, there's several wires. So when they drip the liquid into that funnel, it conducts the electricity. And then it activates this motor and it switch on the switch and it just keeps electrocuting all these dead game characters. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this was a piece inf I used to fix around the house when I was growing up, and my mom used to ask me to check, you know, sometimes you guys might have the same problem. In the back of the toilet, there's uh, water, like a plastic water regulator, and sometimes it's not enough water, and the, the toilet doesn't flush properly. And um, I took that plastic uh, water regulator and put it in these buckets. And so if you are given the bottle of liquid, and when you pour inside the bucket, um, that little plastic floating device rise and it switch on a switch and pass the water from one bucket to the next bucket and then pass on to the next one and then it goes into it triggers the fan to turn on and inside this uh, these two little things um, there's a modified uh, alphabet toy um, a Sesame Street kind of and I have it push um, the letter A it push just A <laughs> apple. Um, this was a piece, um, this is right after 9-11, it was across the street from Ground Zero. This space used to be a bank, and then so after 9-11 there's a lot of abandoned space. And Lower Manhattan Cultural Council decided to organize an exhibition with its 22 artists, and they chose different abandoned sites. And I chose this site because there's a lot of construction things like wood and this bottle left there uh, when they took everything out and um, I decided to bring in motors and microcontrollers to animate all these uh, discarded materials. Um, and so I used all the wood structure to 
build the wood to build these structures, and then that added um, have the motors connected to different strings and bottles, and the bottles were moving around, and so everything becomes kind of alive. Um, this is the this is the brain of the piece, which has a 16 control, 16 channels, and it's controlling different lighting. So we're pulling these strings, and it goes to I sometimes pull these bags and these bottles hitting the windows. And it's at a site where, you know, it's right in front of the, the subway entrance. And, and for a while, that area is quite dark. And then slowly, lights are coming back. People are slowly going back in there. And then they thought some kind of weird stories of opening up. Um, and I was also using liquids in that one. I was using uh, cable ties and and water tubing and then forming these shapes. Um, so when the water pump goes up, um, it fills up. Some of them is green and we're using the same liquid. Uh, some of them is, uh, is red. I'm using food coloring um, to get the red color like this one. And everything is held together by cable ties. Um, this was a, a sound piece. Um, um, all the bottles, I collect a lot of bottles and cans, and uh, all the movements you see here is connected to one single motor here. And um, so this motor, when it rotates, it pulls all these fishing lines in the, in the, very, in the, in the pattern, so it can create a very steady uh, pattern of the when the bottle hits the floor. And you can see, some of them have different amounts of liquid inside, so it creates different tone. Um, this is a piece, uh, it's an installation that I made not for people, for a mouse. Um, there's a, <coughs> this is in Belgium, it's in this kind of a strange zoo, and they have this like hundred white mouse just living in this one space. So I decided to make like a plate land for the mouse. Um, it was more of a challenging place to install because these mouse, they've been living there for a long time, and they're not afraid of people. So when I was installing, they're constantly trying to crawl out my, my shoes, my pants, and the first few days, I was installing, listening to music, and um, I was doing the wiring, um, and I accidentally uh, stepped on one, and I felt really bad, so I went to the pet store, and I bought a, a black mouse, and then I put it back in the, into the space, you know, with all the white ones, and um, so now, I th it's still there right now, um, but I don't know if there's getting variations of colors, you know, like some black and white uh, mouse, and, um, and there's a lot of uh, parts, like, the like Ferris wheel and the train has to be shut off because um, sometimes the mouse go onto the train track or the Ferris wheel is turning and then there are a few accidents and then so some of these moving parts has to be um, shut down but this was an installation for the mouse. Um. Um. This is a series, uh, it's called Organic Concept. Uh, it was taking the same plastic I using the painter's plastic. And um, I was doing, trying to, putting them in many different places or having coming out different places. This, so what I do is I take that sheet of plastic and I hand tie them, um, you know, segment, section to section, and then I fold them. And I take a, you know, 20 inch box fan you get at a hardware store. And, uh, and I inflate them so the water is, I mean, the water, the air is constantly flowing through. And since the plastic is very thin, there's about 0.35 mil, um, it's very light. And then um, they um, just form these shapes and it generates a lot of static electricity um, when you play with them. Um, sometimes I put, connect them to a motion sensor. So the motion sensor turns on the fan when people come in, so they inflate and deflate. Uh, this one's at Dumbo Art Center in, um, in, I have the plastic coming out of the window of a building and it comes out I think about 
200, 300 feet. And when it's outside, um, the wind just blows around. People can play with it, and then, and then they get this. You know, they get ripped quite easily since it's outdoors. And um, and people start fixing it, so the shapes keep constantly changing. And then, as people play with it, starting to or break it, rip it, they repair it and it gets smaller and smaller. And eventually, um, the piece gets destroyed. Um, this was at a garden in Lower East Side. Um, is the, the garden is sandwiched between two buildings, so the airflow is always like kind of going up and down. And so this piece kind of spirals up and then comes down and goes up and down, and it's kind of containing that between the two buildings. Um, this was at Union Square Park in Manhattan. I borrowed my friend's car, um, and then we drove it into the park. And we, I have the tubes coming out of the doors and the sunroof and the trunk of the car. And so the tube's starting to get bigger and bigger. Eventually, it kind of covers the car. But the car, you can still kind of see the car inside. And during that time, I met these dancers um, at the park, and then they asked me if I want to do like a last minute collaboration. I said, okay, sure, you know, you can go in and just do whatever you want. And so they're climbing on the roof of the, uh, the hood of the car, they start dancing on it, and there's a person, there's a, on top I forgot to tell them there's a sunroof. And um, so at one point, one person just kind of disappeared and they, like, they climbed out. And then, but it's kind of a spontaneous collaboration, which I thought was kind of interesting. I never know what's going to happen. Um, this was a space uh, in Soho. It's a furniture store. They let me borrow their space for just one day. And then I decided to fill the bag, um, the tube, in their furniture store. So when people um, go in to look for furniture, they have to kind of walk through this kind of intestinal kind of environment to find a table or a sofa or a chair. Um, this was at the Queens Museum. They have a New York City panorama left over from the 1963 World Fair. And um, I decided to put, um, use the Atlantic Ocean side um, and build these different types of inflatables. They look, like, they look like these giant creatures coming out of the ocean. This is uh, Brooklyn, and this is the controller that controls all the different parts uh, of the turning the fans on and off. Because it's indoors, um, there's no wind blowing the plastic, so I wanted to use this system to kind of create the different movements of the plastic. And um, so this is the, it's on a bridge that goes to Staten Island. So a lot of my working process, um, I collect a lot of materials and I bring them to the studio and um, sometimes I, in the beginning I don't really do much sketches. I, everything, the, the, the look of the piece kind of determined by their function. Um, if I want to put in like a light and um, then it gets hot inside so I decided to put a cooling fan but then the fan needs to know when the light is on. So I put the microcontroller to tell the fans, like, oh, the light is on, so it's going to get hot inside, so it'll cool off the interior. So, and then everything's just kind of, kind of keep building, and so the aesthetic just kind of keep growing um, as the need of the function. Uh, you probably see uh, this video um, outside. Um, this is another piece um, 
This is a piece that uses a lot of computer cooling fans. Um, this is the, the kind of like the bone, the structure of the piece. And all these are computer cooling fans. And what I'm doing is I take uh, two fans, um, one, they're kind of facing each other. So one fan will inflate and the other fan will kind of suck the air out. Um, and then I use uh, like a Christmas light fader. It's like a two channel fade, fader. So when channel one is on, channel two is off, and then the other way around. Um, so all these are corners of garbage bags. Um, so that's when one fan is inflating it, and then when it deflates, the other fan sucks it in. This one doesn't have a computer chip inside. It's, it's pure analog. Um, this was at an installation in uh, Santa Monica Pier. Um, it was part of this project uh, called Glow, and it's like an all-night event by the, by the beach. So I chose to use the space underneath the pier, because um, it's kind of a narrow, it's really long. It's about maybe like 150 feet to 200 feet long, and um, people can walk through it. And it's an interesting space because when people are you know, looking at the piece, they can smell the ocean, they can hear, you know, they can feel the wind, um, and then, and it's very narrow, it's like about 20, well it's not that narrow I guess, it's like 20 feet wide, but just since it's so long. Um, and as you walk through, um, there's two layers, like sections, one is for pedestrian walk, the other one is for bike path. So there's two, two different heights of view of this piece. And everything in here also, um, I use a lot of computer cooling fans. Um, and then some parts of the pier, I think it's starting to crack and then so there's these gaps and that's filling them with different inflatables as well. And a lot of the pieces here is so um, it's still analog at the time. I'm like using the same Christmas light fader. Uh, you start using those first, and then, and then the more and more um, I want to have a better control of the the different light patterns and the movement of the tentacle, I start switching the system to um, microcontroller. Like in this piece, um, you know, everything is starting. I starting to put microcontroller in there. Um, sometimes when you s just look at the outside, it might be difficult to tell on the, um, maybe some of the difference. Um, but these ones are a little bit more evolved and, um, and they're also made from corners of garbage bags and the fans and Tupperware containers. I'm using magnifying sheets for reading and um, these are another type of computer cooling fans on the side. So the, the spinning and the twisting is also by the the air pushing the, pushing the work itself. Um, that's the same uh, painter's plastic, the plastic I use. Yeah, I use, um, um, I don't know if you heard of the Euro sealer, you know, this is in the infomercial maybe like maybe 10 years ago. It's when you're eating a, let's say you get a bag of potato chips and you don't finish, you can try to reseal it. And I got one of those, but a lot of the bags, potato chip bags, they're too thick and doesn't work really well. But for the painter's plastic, the 0.35 mil, they work really well. You can just fold it up. They look like a stapler. And then you can just yeah, roll it up and, and seal it. Okay, some of you might have these at night, uh, I mean, at your house. When you go traveling, sometimes you put your light on these light sensors. So when the sun comes up, the light shuts off. And then the, when the sun goes down, the light turns on. So it looks like somebody's at home. Um, I take that sensor and then I cut out the, the light sensor part of it. And I take an extension line and basically pull the, the light sensor away from the body. So then now, and then I resolder the wire back. And then I take modeling clay and uh, wrapped around the light sensor, and then I stick it onto the television, and then I videotape, um, I videotape my eye, um, 
So using the dark part of the eye, tricking the sensor, thinking it's nighttime to turn on the, the light bulb. And then the white part, thinking it's daytime. <coughs> so with a similar concept, I started exploring like, OK, so this one has one eye turning on the light bulb. This one has four eyes. And each eye is turning on uh, one device. So one is turning on the, the red LED light, one is blue, and the fans. And um, this one is turning itself around in the television. So the, when the eye hit the sensor, it activate this motor, so it turned the television around. So it seems like the TV has some. Um, yeah, that's my eye. <laughs> This one is watching like a video of how the work is made. <laughs> um, this one is turning on the liquid water, so the eyeball activates a water pump, and then they pump that same liquid that used before uh, through the bottle, and it comes down. <coughs> so when I was doing this project, um, some people saw it's like, oh, why do you use Asian eye? And then that time, I wasn't really thinking about Asian eye; it's just my eye. And then so I started thinking about, um, so I started thinking about, okay, then maybe I should start collecting different kinds of eyes, like people from different backgrounds. So I made this helmet so it's easier for other people to do this. And then so people can put on the helmet and then it has a, a camera strapped on it and there's two images. Um, one, it's a, it's a cat and the other one's like a family picture. So this way, and I calibrate the eyes, the eyes in the center of the frame. And they have to look at those two Im the, the pictures. And then I made this video that I to try to show other people the idea to extract the eyes. Um, and these are some of the volunteers that donated their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so at the end, I have like a collection of different eyes which I can use for different pieces in the future. And then I was sort of trying out like different makeup and then to give different textures on the, the skin. Um, in 2007, um, I did a research fellowship at the Smithsonian studying bioluminous organisms. And that time, it's like a, a two and a half month program where I didn't have to make anything. I can just spend time just looking at, uh, I was looking at different type of creatures like fish or jellyfish or anything that produces light and just kind of learning about them, see what they look like, the, looking at the environment they're from. And, um, and some of them and their, their behavior um, and how they use light to either uh, attract mates or find food or defend. Um, these are angler fish and I think this is like a gulper eel. And these are specimens, so it's, they look quite different because they're already pulled out of the ocean. And um, a lot of times, because the water pressure is different, when, when I look at them, their guts already kind of come out of their mouth because the water pressure is really different. Um, but a lot of the, there's some interesting stuff. It's like, you know, with um, yeah, these fish, they haven't been identified. They have kind of like legs, but they kind of swim. And they have this weird kind of horn-like things in front of their head. Um, so I was looking at like, well, how do they, you know, there's like a symbiosis relationship between um, bioluminous bacteria and like anglerfish, um, the little thing on the top here, it's, a, it's not a new organ, it's like an evolved a dorsal fin that kind of pops in the front and then somehow bacteria just kind of stuck on it and then, and when the fish eats, it feeds to the bacteria. So they have this kind of relationship where they both benefit, um, the, that light help them attract the small fish. At um, the same time, I, when I was looking at a lot of these uh, specimens, I was finding out um, you know, some of these anglerfish have these little things attached to them, almost like, uh, almost like I thought like, are they parasites or something? Like this one, this is, see there's a little thing attached to it here. And what I found out is this, this is a female. Female is much larger than the male. And when the male finds a female, they bite onto the female's body, and basically they kind of shrink down. And they don't die completely, but just enough, like, but that the sperm is still alive. Um, and so they just grab onto the female, and you know, kind of, when the female eats the, their nutrients, kind of feeds onto the male. And um, 
So sometimes the female will have like uh, several males attached to them. And like this one has two males attached to them. This is a female. And when the female is ready to get pregnant, you know, she has some choices. Um, <laughs> um, this is a flashlight fish. They have these light organs underneath their eye. And the light organ has these, they have almost like an eyelid. They can open and close um, that light organ. So they can basically kind of turn on the light and shut off the light. And um, they use these light to sometimes if a predator, like a bigger fish, is trying to eat them, they'll swim towards them, flash the light, and shut it off and make a quick left turn or right turn. <laughs> and so kind of turn on the headlight, suddenly shut off and then escape. Um, this is a called for EO. Um, they also have light organ, but it's on the very end of the tail. Oh, this is an interesting one. This is a hatchet fish, and they have light organs on their belly. And they have these kind of a light sensor on their back. And what they do is, like, if you're a predator and then you're looking up, like, if you're looking up, you can see, like, you know, the contour of the fish, so a hatchet fish. But, so their belly, the light organ, what they do is they mimic the light coming from the surface of the ocean to break apart, you know, to camouflage themselves. So if you're looking up, it's harder to see them. So now they produce, see, and then it's harder to see them. So it's not as clear. Um, but at the same time, um, this other fish, their eyes become more evolved to distinguish the difference. You know, is this coming from the sunlight or is this coming from the fish? And so this is constant um, thing happening. Um, and they're about, they're not very big, they're about the size of your hand. And they have very shiny, uh, reflective uh, body. Um, This one, yeah, these are, these are all the light organs. That's their bones and cartilage. Um, <coughs> and these are firefly squid. Um, these are footage from a Japanese uh, fishing boat. Um, they're edible. Um, they have like hundreds and hundreds of little uh, photophores on their body and all the way up to their tentacles. Um, they're very bright, and sometimes they use that to maybe attract smaller uh, fish or little shrimps. And then, oh yeah, this is a vampire squid. Um, they have light organs on the tip of their tentacles, and they also have these two light organs on their head. But it looks like their eye, but it's not their eye. Just there to kind of, you know, for self-defense, when they are in danger, they flip their body inside out. And the uh, inside of their body has, um, so has a lot of spikes. And so this is, this is when, this is what they look like. And when they flip inside out, they look like this. Like this is when they're flipping their body inside out. It's like these two dots, it looks like their eye, but that's not their eye. It's just a light organ. And then, oh yeah, this is uh, these ostracods and copepods. Um, these one, they shoot out uh, almost like light missile. And they shoot out in the opposite direction where they're going to escape. So this is a... Um, this is ostracod. They have like these big eyes, and so these ones like to eat this, and so they shoot these light organs out to the opposite direction, and they swim away to confuse them. Um, yeah, there's different ones. Some of them are bacteria, and some of them is a chemical reaction, um, mixing with like oxygen, and then it glows. Um, um, th this one, it's a it's a shrimp that shoots out uh, kind of bio sticky bioluminous glue, uh, glue kind of. So if a big fish trying to eat it, it kind of swim backwards and shoots out these like bioluminous sticky glue, and then it'll stick onto the the fish face or the head, and then kind of makes the that fish like 
glow and then make, make it make more vulnerable to even larger fish. Like their heads will kind of glow. Um, this is like a, this is one of the brightest uh, jellyfish. Um, um, its entire body flashes. I mean, some some of the flash functions, like scientists, they're not quite sure. You know, like a lot of them is just by chance. Um, uh, this one is not bioluminescent. This was iridescent. Um, maybe a long time ago that people thought it was bioluminescent, but it was just the cameraman, the, the light reflecting from the camera, the light. Um, they have a bunch of little combs, and that's how they swim. And, and they reflect light really easily, so you get this kind of rainbow pattern. Um, so during that research, I kind of came across these other ones, and I just really like the, the shape and how they swim around and the color of them. A lot of them, they, you know, their color has this red tone to it because once you get to a certain depth, like fish don't see the, the spectrum, the red color, so it's like a good camouflaging um, method. Um, this is, yeah, this one is kind of weird. This one is not bioluminescent or iridescent, but I was interested in like when it's in the infantile stage, the eyes is really far apart from the body, and when it becomes adult, it kind of gets close to the body. Um, this is a uh, dumpo octopus. This is when they're young, and this is when they get become older. And um, what's interesting about this one, they don't use their tentacles to swim. They have these like kind of like flippers. They use this to swim. They're about the size of a beach ball, and then it's kind of this like, white color, and then I think it's just kind of weird looking, and it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I was looking at a lot of different ones. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, this is called, it's a snapping shrimp. Um, they snap their claws really fast, and they produce this sound, and it stuns the small fish or shrimp and then they kind of pass out and they eat them. And they were trying to do a study, like how does it produce uh, that sound? Is it by um, two objects hitting each other? Or you know, can they, how do they do that? So they put a high speed camera and what they found out is um, it's not two objects hitting each other, it's when the claws close, it pushes, there's a air pocket in here. It actually, it generates an air bubble. It pushes an air bubble out. And when the air bubble pops, that's where the sound comes out. And it's not two objects hitting each other. So you squeeze in the air bubble. It goes in really fast. And the air bubble comes out. And then it pops. And then that's how it stuns the, the little fish. So here's a, like a slow, you can see the air bubble comes out. Air bubble comes out. And then it collapses. And then it, that's how it makes the sound. So, yeah, so these are kind of the things um, um, I was looking at and kind of maybe help inspire some of the work and affect some of the things. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that happens a, a lot. So I, I always try to, you know, build in the studio and have it run for a while and see what type of problem I'll come across. Um, the ones that you see in this show, they, they kind of, they have, they're the one that kind of survive all the equipment I have tried to use. Um, like the the fans, uh, the computer cooling fans, they're gotten really good. Um, their life is much longer. The relays, the click sounds you hear in installations, they're these relays, and I think they have like. 75,000 click life. Um, that's on the manufacturer, that's what they say. Um, but yeah, so a lot of times, like, you know, something will not work, and I'll try to find out why. Um, like, for, for, this sh for this show, when I was installing, there was like a, the main control box, you know, all the small pieces that's around. Um, I had these ACDC adapter. I was turning them on and off very fast, and then it wasn't fast enough for the transformer to transform the AC power to DC power. So I kind of rewired it so, um, so it, it's not doing that. You know, I kind of did that the last minute to make it go a little faster. Um, yeah, but these problems happen a lot. I try to test most of the things out in my studio first. 
Um, yeah, so these are kind of like the survival. <laughs> these are the ones that kind of survive. Yeah. Did, did your study of the bioluminescent uh -huh. um, fish or other forms of it precede your project or, or this mm -hmm. um, concept or come after you began it? Well, your um, before, before I did the research, I, I was really interested in a lot of science and biology. And then I think it has some reflection in my work. And then someone saw my work and nominated me to apply for that uh, research fellowship. They say, well, maybe you can look at this and maybe it'll help um, um, with your work, you know. And um, so after I did the research, I think the most uh, uh, influence I have from the research is, you know, certain light patterns. Um, I was started thinking more about more diverse uh, blinking patterns and chase patterns and the movements of the tentacles and the piece itself because a lot of stuff in the deep ocean is kind of everything moves in slow motion. And I was trying to use more uh, fans to create these kind of slow moving uh, movements. And your work preceding this project or in um, what might that be or is, has this been your primary focus? Um, you mean the focus of, you know, the Um, sometimes, um, because a lot of times depend on the, um, cause there, cause sometimes on certain shows people, I have done shows where people are just focusing on plastic materials and, um, and then since I use a lot of plastic, it's kind of depends on it. Sometimes the theme, you know, kind of force people to look at more materials and then, um, but it varies. Um, a lot of the LED, yeah, a lot of LEDs I use are um, for cars, so they're all 12 volt DC. You got the car batteries, 12 volt DC, and uh, a lot of them were for uh, are for um, you know those people that trick up their car. They put these light displays like under the car, and you know those things, and I, or for trucks. Um, because I went on this website, they were just selling all the LED parts for for cars, and then and. I started using those before. I was using the more individual LED, the three volts that doesn't have a resistor or a dial in it. Um, but it's very, it's more difficult or more. You have to do more work to to mix different colors together because the red and then the white they they pull different power. So if you put a red and a white together, the red will get. I mean, the white will get more power. Oh no, red will get more power. And then so. But with those car ones, they have uh, resistors and dial built into it, so I can mix color much easier and put them on the same circuit. Because you use like a single color chip, so you're not using like the RGB stuff? Or um, yeah, no. I, uh, oh, you mean the one that already mix in one single one? Right, right. Yeah, I was using those before too. Um, but now I start using, they're more stable because the way they're constructed. So, and then they, they seem to. Uh, they're not t that sensitive to, you know, if there's something pulling more power, um, it doesn't push too much power into the light and burn it out. You're yeah. using just all individual colors and then yeah, and doing it with the controls. Right, the yeah, so I have the controls to, so the red and the green or the red blue to get the purple and... Uh, and is it all super basic like consumer, like you talked about the two channel, the Christmas light? Um, the ones in here, I was using a basic stamp, um, I th uh, computer chip, and the relay board. I think those chips, um, I think they're using pinball machines too. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, I think, I mean, now a lot of people are using like Arduino uh, chips and, uh, Yeah, I th I've thought of, uh, thought about it, but I haven't gotten like, because with biological things, like more organic things, um, yeah, I haven't really used it. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I saw, I heard uh, when someone was telling me that during World War II, they will, some of the Japanese soldiers will carry these dried up ostracods, the bioluminous um, little things, and, and um, they will pour some in their hand, add some water, crush them, and blow air, and they will glow. And then they use that method to look at the map instead of using like a lighter or a flashlight so they don't give away their location. So it has that function. And that same, uh, the same um, thing that I think they're using for like cancer gene uh, marker, like to so put in a cancer cell so when they do duplicate, you can see where the cancer is. Um, yeah, but I haven't really worked with those. Yeah, I don't know what to mm -hmm. kind of get those. And, and they, I, mean, I tried to, I played around with fireflies before but they don't last very long. You know, <laughs> try to take some of the <coughs> things out. Um, yeah. How much does the space influence um, what you're building? Because it seems like some of the stuff you showed us was really, in terms of your planning at least, was mm -hmm. really specific to the space, or mm -hmm. the shape of the space. Um, yeah, sometimes, um, and you saw those, uh, the breathing uh, garbage bags. Um, that piece started when I was at uh, sculpture park uh, north of New York I was looking for a place to do to make something and then I was just walking through this trail and then I came across this uh, like a pile of garbage just kind of sitting there and I think those trails people maybe do morning jogs or and I thought it would be funny that when people are walking by and that this one bag just <laughs> breathing it's like it's coming alive and then, so so then I put one there and I had it set on the timer so it turns on every morning around <laughs> 5 a.m. and shut off at like 7, 8 p.m. And from that I started thinking about like, oh, so it's like back becoming alive, then what happened when they grow up? You know, so I started experimenting <laughs> with more complex, like, okay, now maybe it's two bags, three bags, and then, so, so that, that bag thing kind of came out of that. So maybe be, the beginning was more like, oh, it'd be funny to just see. <laughs> you know. Did you record the responses? No, I couldn't put a camera there. I was just imagining what people were, you know, <laughs> thinking about. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, thank you, by the way. Yeah, this is really welcome. interesting. Thank and you. Really um, the, how you seal the actual mm -hmm. optic? Is it, you do it yourself? You heat seal it? Yeah. Yeah? I heat seal it. Is it like with an iron? Like um, well, I started with that Euro sealer, like a stable. Uh, you can get a Bed Bath and Beyond. They're like ten dollars, and um, you put two double A battery inside. You can fold it. Like yeah, the infomercial. <laughs> yeah, the infomercial one. And then, but but later on, I was making a lot of these plastic. And once you do like maybe like a hundred of them, that this um, some of the I start wearing out the this piece on the um, on that machine, and then. So I took uh, this uh, another type that looks like a soldering iron that ha but has a wheel on the end, and then I bought um, this material and I cut it so it doesn't stick. When the plastic gets heated up, it gets sticky, and I wrap that around the wheel, and then this way, yeah, almost. So this way I can make you know more larger quantities of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the big ones. Yeah. Oh no, big ones. They're hand tied. The hand tied together, uh, the small t uh, tentacle don't one. Have to be heat sealed, no, those you don't have to because when so basically I fold them up and hand tie it, and when you pump air into it, they start inflate, and when there's enough air pressure, they seal themselves up. So you can you have to open it and air comes out, but it has this strange kind of folding effect. So I kind of discovered it accidentally. I was uh, wrapping a sculpture up. Uh, with that plastic, and then the sculpture has fans inside, and um, <laughs> and then one day I turn it on without removing that plastic, and it kind of fills it up. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. What if I keep tying it, and then see how long I can get the piece? Um, so that one is just all hand tied together that's a, for the larger ones. Yeah. Something that also just came to mind. I live in New York, and there's an, um, a street art. It's not as sophisticated. The, the animals. Yeah. Yeah. So like about the subway grate. Yeah, the subway. Like, and I was like, I was thinking yeah. it'd be really cool to see your stuff because it's so much more. Um, yeah, because I remember, it, like, for he, I remember he was talking about like, like giraffe has to be this train because it's, the train's longer. 
so there's more air pushing <laughs> right. because the neck. Right. The neck. Yeah, if it's a bear, he's like, okay, maybe like, what was it? I forgot which train was like the R train, so okay. Or so. there's like, so different animals has depends on which train goes through. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah. I remember he's, he used like garbage bags and uh, like black garbage bags or different types. Yeah, I like that. Say, are you influenced kind of by movies and music? Like, I see Blade Runner and you know, kind of Alien, or I mean, yeah, I like, does, that, does that come into effect at all? Is that I, I like sci fi movies a lot, but I mean, a lot of times the, the story is, uh, but the, some of the decorations <laughs> and how they set up the you know, the, the internal um, like the design they have for like the spaceships or the plant alien planets, and the, I find them kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, I like the yeah, the Blade Runners. I, when I was little, I remember um, like MacGyver and, like, just making things <laughs> up, uh, trying to you make a CD player out of a pile of garbage or something, you know, like, modifying <laughs> things. Yeah, and then, yeah, because I remember the earlier when I was little, I, mean, I watched MacGyver in Taiwan that they have it, but translated into Mandarin. And the earlier ones, they show more process, like how he built something. And I remember the later, the later ones. Because there was some incident, some people tried to actually build the I mean, mimic the <laughs> show, build something, and then so they have to change some of the process and simplify it, and so people can't really just make it or something. Um, I remember. Oh, what was the other one? A Team, the older <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah, those are kind of the TV shows I grew up. With. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering, you know, how much you think about the that kind of fan experiential um, moment uh, when you're making one. Um, I think, I mean, sometimes I think about it, but sometimes it's hard to predict how audience who you know, there's some audience they're kind of the more um, they like to be more passive observers, and some people like to be very active and. Yeah, you know, touching it and or um, yeah, so it it varies. Um, like like the one with um with, with the turkey baster, that one because that one is very the, the audience has to touch those objects. So because sometimes when when the audience have to touch it, like many people using the thing, you have to kind of build it really robust. Um, so the interaction, it, it kind of depends. Yeah, um, I think for audience to touching it and then or pushing it, um, I don't do that as much um, because especially I'm running electricity through um, and then <laughs> I'm not sure how the audience will respond because some of them can get more adventurous. They, they kind of go beyond the... Um, Thank you.